Welcome everyone to another episode of our Global Employability Expert Series from Virtual Internships. I hope you are really comfortable and ready to have a really interesting webinar. So my name is Mirta Aguirre. I'm the head of employability of virtual internships, and I'm going to be your host for today. Let me remind you a little bit how the webinar works. So we are recording this session. So later on, you can um, watch it again, share it with people uh, you think uh, can enjoy this talk as well. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find our previous um, webinars and you can have all the content we have created for you. You can ask questions during this webinar. Please uh, do it through the Q&A uh, box below. You have the chat and then you have the Q&A. Please use the Q&A. So I have all the questions ready there and we are going to um, reply to them during our webinar. And if not, at the end, we will have uh, time to cover these questions. If you have specific questions about your program, please reach out to your IEM. It's a person you have been in contact with all this time. So uh, for any specific questions on your program, please reach out to your IEM. Okay, so without further ado, let's explore what our interesting topic is for today. So the topic is what employers are really looking for in young graduates. I think this is a very interesting topic and let's, discover who is going to be our speaker for the day. So let's meet Jonathan Brill. Jonathan Brill is an expert on employability since his business has focused on this topic for the past two decades. Initiatives have included the Graduate Employability Test, Android D Research and Eduvate's online career fair. His current emphasis is to create and develop the best digital employability experiences for young adults to ensure their optimum effectiveness in the working world. Previously, Jonathan was the chairman of five organizations in the third sector, including the London Arts Board, Rose Bradford College Governors, and the John Benedetti Charitable Trust. And what are we going to discuss about during this webinar? In this webinar, Jonathan will discuss what employers really want from recruits at early stage of the talent pipeline. From his extensive experience as a CEO of Edubate's Online Career First, employers value and rank highly resilience and flexibility. They also value the ability to learn, which nowadays young adults can achieve through game experiences, both offline and virtual. These and many other interesting topics, we're going to cover them with Jonathan. And so welcome, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to have you in our webinar today. Thank you. And hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today, all the way from Edinburgh in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're joining from Scotland in the UK. I'm from Argentina. You are from all over the world. So. Um, the idea is to really have an interesting uh, conversation on this super interesting and re relevant topic to our audience, right? So first of all, I have introduced you a little bit about, uh, you have, I read a little bit about your experience, but can you tell us a little bit more about your experience? What makes you an expert in employability? Let us know. What makes me an expert is what other people say, not what I think of myself. Uh, I've been working in the field for a long time. I used to work at a big university, Brunel University, uh, where I was director of teaching and learning. And I moved from there into the private sector, into uh, pr the profit laden center per sector, perhaps working in this area, but looking particularly at the join between what happens after high school and university and what happens after university and work. And that's the area that I've been working in for, uh, as you say, a couple of decades, particularly this last venture that we've been working on uh, has been the online careers fair, eduvate.biz. And there we have a large amount of content for open perusal by anyone who wants to come in to the website. All they do is register, sign up, and you're off. And there's stuff about universities, there's stuff about 
directly about jobs from employers. And so it's a cornucopia of really interesting stuff. But uh, then came COVID. Then came oh, the pandemic. And of course, things have had to, to change. And so the website, the way we operate, what we do has had to change in line with lots of other businesses. Exactly, right? COVID has uh, proven to be um, a force of change, right? Whether if we uh, perhaps wanted it to be slower or, well, world change, that's a reality. And um, COVID has affected every aspect of our lives and particularly work, right? Uh, and you mentioned something really interesting. You worked at universities, private sector, third sector. So you have a big um, view of, of what's going on. And what is it about now with COVID? Okay, what is the key question is, what are employers looking for, in especially young graduates, right? And what is it now? How does COVID affect these? How has it changed? What can you tell us? I can tell you a lot. Um, uh, part of it is trying to develop a different understanding about different employment sectors because never has the employment market, particularly for young adults, been so skewed by COVID. So we have a situation, and I was talking with a, a leading recruitment company this morning about this, and saying that in the tech sector, for instance, there are more and more jobs emerging. It is a very fruitful area. He would argue that the universities are not very good suppliers to that market because of the way they approach things. And I might talk about that a bit later. So that's very hot. And he in this recruitment company is having to employ more recruiters in order to satisfy the contracts that they're being asked to do. Find me one of these, two of these, three of these, cyber security, blockchain, artificial intelligence, whatever it is in this kind of area. Equally and oppositely, we have a different situation in the hospitality, for instance, on cruise ships, in hotels, in areas where they can't find sometimes the people, but also the market itself is so uncertain that we can't be clear what's going on. And then we have direct shortages in areas like truck drivers. Simple and easy. We need to get trucks to deliver goods from A to B, and there ain't the people to do it. So it is a very skewed job market and varies from employer to employer and from sector to sector. Yeah, it seems that, um, well, the situation has affected sectors differently, right? And so you mentioned something super, uh, well, we, we can see this. There are many, many jobs being offered in the tech sector. Yep. What is going on with graduates nowadays? Are they ready to take these uh, new jobs in specifically in the tech sector? Yes, and then again, no. Yes, in the sense that if graduates stick in presenting themselves to employers to what they've studied at university, I am a graduate in archaeology, then you're leaving it very obscure as to whether you can get a job in tech. But you might, because of the technical stuff you learned in archaeology, digging things up, trying to establish what age they were, trying to work out where they should go. But also in your spare time, when you've been on the computer, gaming, learning things and so on, there are a lot of techniques that you may well have had, which an employer wants to buy. But if you stick to, I got a 2-1 in history and English, 
and don't bring in all this other stuff, you're not going to you're not going to get that job. Yeah, that's something very interesting there, what you're saying. It seems that, at least in my own experience, I finished university a while ago. Well, I, I study all the time, so I, not so while ago. My first degree was a while ago. But when I left university, I studied international relations. I wasn't sure about what I could do, right? Because if someone asked me, okay, what, tell me about yourself, I would say I'm a graduate in international relations. And oftentimes people is like, okay, so what does that mean, right? What does allow you to do? And in that sense, it's super important to reflect on skills, what you were just mentioning, right? Okay, what do I know? What can I do? And sometimes we struggle a little bit in identifying the skills we have. And as you mentioned, we may even have skills that for our degree, we may say they're only applicable to archaeology. But as you mentioned, if I say, wait, what is archaeology about? What skills do I have? And then I can realize that I can use these skills in other sectors, right? Because what can you tell us a little bit of skills? Um, how important are skills for job search for professional development? One of the interns that I recruited through virtual internships wrote to me this morning, uh, uh, Enrico, and he's based in Italy. And he was talking about the value of the internship that he did with us. And it was exactly about that, what he called transferable skills. Now, he was uh, a history graduate and very, very good uh, at understanding that process. What he did for us was to work on a project examining who our competitors were in Italy, a thing that we didn't know. And so by the end of his internship with us, he had completed a 70-page report fully analyzing 10 different companies, properly structured, referenced with uh, all sorts of bits and pieces like um, the right analysis, the correct uh, information in the right places. And he knew about that in a history context, but we showed him how to apply it into a business context. And that's what I mean when I talk about transferable skills. That's beautiful, yeah. exactly. Uh, one might think, okay, what do I know about business? But hey, you know how to analyze information, you know how to put information together, how make sense of it. And that can be used for any industry. And in this case, well, the student applied it um, for a different field. And that's the beauty of skills, right? And skills development, that sometimes we, um, think, okay, I'm not sure what I can do because I studied something too specific. And then if we break down a little bit of what uh, these um, knowledges and skills um, that we have, we already have, how we can be aware of that and, and share it during an interview and to apply it in a new job, right? And Jonathan, in, in your experience, right? Um, what are the most valuable skills at the moment? What are the essential skills that if I I'm a recent graduate, what skills do I need to have? Well, let's distinguish between life skills on the one hand and professional skills on the other, for want of a better word. So again, referring back to my uh, conversation with uh, my colleague in recruitment at the moment, where the general context is tech is hot, what we have to understand is what he called the JP Morgan effect. And that is that for the same high level skills, JP Morgan and other huge companies are willing to pay vast amounts of money to the, to the young graduates. Now these same high level technical skills are needed in the local port or the local distributor network locally. But they can't afford to pay the same salaries as JP Morgan. So what's happening is that the JP Morgans of this world siphon off the really high skilled people. So what the, the lesser well-known companies, they may be great companies, but less well-known and not paying so much, they are going to be working on reskilling and upskilling. These so are they, very important terms. Can you yeah. explain what upskilling and reskilling are? Because these yeah. are words that we may hear a lot, 
when we, we read about employment? What do these mean exactly? When you reskill, you're looking at a set of competencies which an individual has, but are being used in a different way, slightly like the example I mentioned about Enrico, but more into the technical space. So you're taking a basic understand, but saying, no, not quite. Our understanding is slightly different. Let's reskill you in a particular way. Or you may have been doing some particular kind of job which you were doing, and that job has disappeared. And so you need to reskill in order to do another job. Upskilling is taking a core level of confidence, competence and bringing it up a level and then bringing it up another level. The important thing in all of this is that it's very easy, maybe not very easy, comparatively easy for an employer to set out what needs to be done in terms of the skills levels. But to get that learning taken on board by the individual is something different. And that individual needs to be at bottom prepared to learn. And that is a flexibility of attitude, which is needed within, within the employer. I was very good at this, and now you want to change me to do that? Yes. Why? Well, that's what the company, that's what the organization needs. And so you need to reskill. Or I'm perfectly happy as I am. Yes, but the company needs you to move up a level of skills that is upskilling. And you need that flexibility of attitude in order to accomplish that properly. Yes, and, and you hit something very important, right? You mentioned, okay, we need to be flexible. I understand that you're talking about this flexibility in terms of how we can adapt. And definitely to adapt, we need to learn, right? And so I was uh, looking at, well, all the websites I, I look about employability, and someone said, okay, imagine it's, this is like um, Aladdin's genius in the lamp, right? Okay, if you could ask just one wish, what wish could that be? Probably if you're smart enough, you could say, I want limitless wishes, right? So I can keep on asking for more wishes. If we think about um, skill, okay, what one skill could you have that could make you expand, that everything else could be possible for you? And at the moment, uh, the speaker said, well, that's the ability to learn, right? To learn and keep on learning. So learning is a crucial ability because if we don't keep on learning, how can we then develop new skills and new knowledge? What is your view on this, Jonathan? I think from experience of talking to employers and what we do here, it's more important to bring to the company a capacity to learn than a body of knowledge which you've learned at university or college or, or whatever, for the reasons that you've mentioned. And that comes as a big disappointment to some students who think, oh, I can do this. And we move into the job. I've learned that. I did that in year three. I can do that. And it may be that that's no longer required. Or what was taught was out of date. A lot of employers say that what universities are doing, a lot is out of date. So what you have to bring is a willingness and a capacity to learn, but you need to know how to learn and how you learn as an individual. Let me take two examples at the extremes. At one end, you learn best with a mentor. And at the other end of the scale, you learn best when left on your own, given a basic task and left off on your own. And where do you fit within all of that? And understanding how you learn, and an employer, dare I say so, needing to understand how you learn are really important things when we are moving into this area of rejigging your workforce, upskilling or reskilling. Yeah, and that's very important uh, what you mentioned regarding 
knowing how we learn, right? How each of us learns. Um, some people, um, I, I, I like both, right? Um, I really value having someone I can ask questions to, right? Having this mentor figure. At some times, I also need my own space and really go um, Google things first. Something we can definitely do first is, I don't know how to do something, Google it. Probably you will always find an answer. Uh, and then from that moment, you can start saying, okay, who can give me a hand? Who can I ask? What tutorials I can look for in YouTube. YouTube have so, has so many content, right? So knowing how we um, learn better is essential. How can uh, we learn? What are the options as for um, new graduates uh, wanting to include new skills? And I have already finished university, so I don't want to go back to university again. Well, how can I learn new skills? I think the, there's a difference between the question asked within the learning, within the workplace and outside the workplace. Within the workplace, the companies, the organizations need to facilitate your learning. It's a difficult word, but they're not there really to teach you because of all the resource that you're talking about that is available. They need to be aware of that resource, point you in the right direction, let you work in there and then bring you back and see whether you've learned it. Facilitate your learning, not teach you, not transmit information, but allow you to come about it yourself. And outside the workplace, that is when you're looking for a job or, or in your spare time, in a way, the way I do it is, I've got to imagine that that process is taking place and what, I stand outside myself and say, what is going to facilitate my learning? How am I going to do this? Goodness me, compared to when I was the age of a lot of this audience, the opportunities to learn so swiftly and so quickly and so expertly is, is unbelievable. I gave a lecture maybe 15 years ago to librarians in Denmark. And they said, I described to them what was going on with this newfangled thing called Google. And they said, oh, we could invent one of them. And I said, why bother? Why bother? It will do with infinite more resource, anything you can bother to do. And so, it's, and so it has come about in, in these 15 years. You can do so much in research and in learning simply by sitting at the desk and working. The question, that, that's almost obvious, but the issue is how do you organize that? And that is learn how to facilitate your own learning. Yes, and as we start our professional development journey, it is super important to start having this realization about how do I learn? What is best for me? Um, what works for me, right? Because um, we need to put in place strategies. I'm a person who works better during the morning. Am I more motivated during the afternoon? Um, is it okay for me to work in an environment with a lot of noise? Probably not. What do I need to start putting myself in this context of learning and how I can uh, really uh, develop a routine that is going to work for me, right? Especially because when we're talking about skills development, we are thinking uh, in this new context, which is COVID, which requires many digital skills and remote work we know requires also for us to uh, create a, our own timetable, right? Because we're going to have uh, perhaps not so many synchronicus at the same time conversations with my supervisor. I will have to work on my own. I have to be independent. So you mentioned flexibility, adaptability and this willingness to uh, learn all the time as very important skills for uh, any recent graduate. What else can you uh, think of? I think you are also think that resilience is, is important, right? You read my mind. Underpinning all of this is the capacity to keep on keeping on despite 
despite some of the knockbacks that you're going to be having during this. It's all very well to say, oh, I'm going to keep on learning. I'm going to be upskilling. I'm going to be reskilling. But people will knock you back. People will take away things. People will try and put you down. And you need a level of resilience in order to keep this going. And importantly, you need to present to employers evidence that you are resilient because that is what they're looking for. They don't want, as I said previously, the body of knowledge. You might be a good communicator. They might well want that. But if you're going to wilt and fall back because of a setback which happens with their company and COVID has accelerated that or anything like that, then it makes it more difficult for them to employ you make it easy for them to employ you by demonstrating, by giving evidence of your resilience. Yes, and, and um, you are mentioning a very key important um, thing we need to remember. When we uh, get ourselves ready for the job search, right? Which is a very intimidating moment when we are saying, okay, what, uh, how can I start? What should I do? And let's say we have already a job interview range. Uh, what Jonathan is saying is for any interview, we need to provide proof of what you're saying. I cannot just say, well, I'm an excellent communicator. Okay, great. Why? Uh, if I don't know what to say, then at the moment I'm going to say, mm, maybe am I making this up? Oh, no, I really are. But how can I support this, right? So having this um, conscious of, well, our, our development and then saying, okay, um, how can I prepare for an interview? I should really think of moments where I was resilient, okay? What did I mean? Okay, I had this issue at work and then I thought of the solution. This is how it, I implemented it. And there's um, um, a system for interviews. Uh, you all want perhaps to write this down because it's going to be really useful for you. The STAR model, which basically uh, that stands out for situation, task, action, result. When someone asks you, okay, describe a situation where you've been resilient, then you can say, okay, a situation, I had this situation at work, you explain, task, this is um, what I had to do, action, this is what I did, and this is the result. So this star model is really good. And I invite every of our uh, interns today to really start uh, noting this down during their internships on how you know, oh, this has been a really good example of when I have been resilient, when I have been flexible, when I have learned a new skill, right? And then I can write it down and have it ready for an interview. That's really um, interesting what you're saying about having evidence, right, on the skills we have. Yeah, I think what you're saying is tremendously important and it takes you to the stage where you're being interviewed. Yeah, how do we get there? But how do you get there, mate? And this is becoming more and more complex because when there are a lot of applicants for jobs in medium to large companies, there is increasing use of artificial intelligence that is screening the CVs, the covering letters, and, and using what emerges as a result of that artificial intelligence screening to choose the best test, the best 10 candidates. And this yes. is very difficult to combat and fight, but there are ways in which you can do it. There aren't 20,000 different softwares and different artificial intelligence systems. There are a few popular ones which are being used by the big companies. Try and find out how they work, what, they, what they're going to be looking for. It's going to be more intelligent than simple scanning for keywords, which has been used previously. It's going to be better than that from an employer's perspective. But my understanding of artificial intelligence is it's not really there yet. It's not going to take the role of a superhuman who can read 200 covering letters and CVs and choose 10 in, in eight nanoseconds. It's, it's, not going to be the, it's not going to be that. So somewhere between the two is going to lie the truth. And we'll 
sure as eggs is eggs get better artificial intelligence in the system. Whatever it, whatever system is being used, the core point is the one you and I have been stressing, that the evidence rather than the assertion, I am passionate, I am keen, I am a good communicator, the evidence of that will be important in order to get the interview as well as at interview. Yes, and, and you're describing something that is really good to consider. You are talking about um, applicant tracking systems, right? Which is this um, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence who, um, which scans all these CVs, right? And that is yeah. very important to have in mind because when we apply to a job, we need to have our CV um, built in a way that it is friendly to the system and that the CV can be read by the system. Otherwise, if we don't pass this first filter, then our CV is not going to be considered. And it is very important to tailor uh, our CV in the way of including the skills that the job description is asking for, right? We always need to make this and say, okay, if we, they, the, the job description advertises for a specific, they're looking for a specific kind of skills, these skills needs to be in, in, in the CV so the ATS, the applicant tracking system can read it. And also like what men, uh, Jonathan is saying, this evidence in our CV needs to be concrete, right? If I have data about what I have accomplished in my work, then like I said, I increased uh, attendance to the webinar in 50%, I increased 50%, uh, that's a result I can show. So that's something that we want uh, to uh, showcase in our, in our CVs because evidence of what we've done is super important. That is uh, why, um, well, you can tell me, Jonathan, the value of an internship. Right? I was going to say because we can take this opportunity to gather evidence right, on things we have done, projects we have participated, skills we have developed. What is your view on, on an internship and particularly a virtual internship? Uh, Jonathan, as he mentioned, he has also virtual interns, so you have experienced both, um, well, with having interns, right? Yeah, simple sentence, I learn an internship, an interns learn. I learn, the company learns a lot from the interns from different countries. We've had from Italy, from the UAE, from Saudi, from the US, and we've learned a lot from the interns from these countries about the cultural differences, about the way things are done, uh, about how you approach sales and so on. So that's a good thing for our company. We expand and our knowledge can then be passed on to the next interns and so on. Let me tell you uh, what the interns are saying. So we have an intern uh, from uh, the US at the moment, Danon, and she is saying, my internship at Educate is off to a great start. I'm building communication and teamwork skills, exploring my creative side. Jonathan and the team foster an innovative environment. So here we have an intern who's meeting some of these things for the first time and working in an innovative environment. Latifa, who is uh, completed her internship and uh, was from the UAE, is now working again for us. We've employed her again after her internship in order to do some more work for us. She highlights remote work skills and written and oral communications. She's gained reasoning skills by having to contact and reach out to companies and institutions convincing them about the worth of Eduvate and my company. It's, and she raised a very important point here. She says, my experience with Eduvate has shaped my ideas of leadership. I now know that qualities of leader need not only in leading the team and dividing the work, but a good leader needs consistently consistency, passion, management, and acknowledgement of teamwork. And these are the important things. I mentioned earlier that Enrico highlighted transferable skills. These are the sort of things that a good internship will help you with. And I promise you, I'm going to say something controversial, the careers departments at universities will not be able to give you this. Let me see well, one more. Yeah, well, that's something, uh, there are many studies done on, on the fact that well, first of all, many 
uh, students don't even reach out to their uh, career center. So many students go through their whole university experience without actually using the services. And when they use it, sometimes they feel, uh, well, perhaps they kind of really not help me with what I looking for, with what I was looking for. So, but one thing that is um, super important to have in mind is, yeah, having this opportunity to do an internship is the opportunity to apply all the skills that you have gained through your, your education and learn new more because definitely any, there is no just one degree that will teach us everything we need to know. No, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. And especially nowadays that we have, there's a global uh, agreement on the fact that we need to learn uh, the, for the rest of our life, right? We, this is what is called lifelong learning. It doesn't matter uh, if we have just finished university, if we are 10 uh, years down our career, we will always need to learn new things, right? So um, the ability to learn, the skill to learn is something we develop. So having a, this mindset of using my internship really to uh, have clarity on how I learn and how I develop skills, that is super useful because for my next job interview, then I can have evidence of, yeah, I, I can learn how to learn. I can know how to learn. Um, I know how to learn on my own. Um, also, you mentioned something about leadership, right? Leadership is very important. And what is leadership, uh, Jonathan, exactly? When we talk about leadership, what is that? It's moved. It's a term which has moved in, in uh, how, how we look at it. Uh, and Latifa is right. It used to be a kind of a top-down thing. It used to be follow the leader. Uh, and it's not that anymore. It's about working within a team framework. Now, again, I'm going to be a little controversial. There's different sorts of teams. Everyone comes in an interview, almost everyone, and says, oh, I'm a team player. Well, yeah. What sort of team? There's a team in a, in a soccer, in soccer. They play team. They have to be fit. They have to be creative. They have to interplay. They have to listen to the manager. There's a team in a rowing boat, eight people rowing. They do not move interdependently. They move in the same way. They have to row at the same time. Someone shouts at them in order to do it. They increase their pace together. They, they, they slow down together. It's a different type of team. And you need to understand that teamwork is not just one of these simple one size fits all kind of concept. And so leadership, your question, is understanding which sort of team you are working in and working with the other members of this team in order to produce an agreed outcome. And these, are, these things are not ag arrived at in any other way than by conversation and, and, and bringing people together. It's much more complex than walking in to an interview and saying, oh, I'm a good team player. What sort of team do you play in? Yeah, that's a good reflection. I had never thought about it in terms of, okay, I'm a team player, what kind of team? That, that, that makes really sense. And, and once again, right, okay, um, how can I uh, share, how can I uh, prove that I'm a, uh, a good uh, team player? And you mentioned something about leadership and I believe that for leadership, we really need to be great communicators, right? But sometimes when we talk about communication, it seems that communication is about being a great public speaker which it is, okay, because uh, if we are good at communicating, then we are good at uh, doing these great presentations. Uh, but communication is really important also understood from the sense of how do I communicate in my everyday uh, work life, right, with my colleagues, with my supervisor. What uh, can you tell us about the importance of communication and how uh, can we uh, B to how, what can we do to be to practice communication and good communication? What is good, good good communication in the workplace? Let let's talk about before we get to the workplace and talk about communicating with colleagues and communicating with uh, employers and look at it from 
the kind of we're still going through COVID. Uh, and this kind of remote process is absolutely wonderful. We could not have been doing it. We had the technology before COVID, but we were frightened of it. We didn't want to use it. We didn't think it would work. It would be better to go on. So communication, the means of communication, the medium of communication needs to be respected when you are working yourself, looking for a job that's going to earn you money, moving on into the future. It's there's a oh, going back in time, going back in time to prehistory in the 1960s. There was a guy who said the medium is the message. A guy called Marshall McLuhan. The, he actually said the medium is the massage, but that's another uh, whole other story. And that has remained true in the ensuing 50, 60 years. The, the medium in which you're operating, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's a video communication like this, is respecting and understanding that medium is at the core of communication. I mentioned uh, COVID and, and I will bring this in here because I think it's important. It's made a mess of things and it's made a lot of people really unhappy that mental health has suffered. And there has been a big issue in the finances of individuals and, issue, and, and areas of real poverty have, have arisen where they hadn't been before, they were of course before. And so what we are saying in uh, answer to the broadest question that you have to communicate to your employers your employability. It's not a set of things. It's not, it's not like a building where you have two windows up there, two windows there, and a door there, and that is employability. It's an organic thing. Employability is, is made up of a number of human qualities. And you have now, because of these areas of uh, difficulty caused by COVID, real difficulty caused by COVID, you have to demonstrate that you get the world in which you're going into, that you get the, the job and it has wages and it has payment and you know how to deal with this and you know how to move on and you know what's going to be happening if they say, well, we can offer you a pension and, not, and you don't know what a pension is really or how it works. Or anything. You need to have that financial understanding that financial acuity, that financial literacy as part of your employability uh, makeup, which is organic and which you need to communicate to employers. Okay, so this is interesting. So you're saying that financial literacy is part also of one of the many skills we need uh, for a professional life, right? If I'm understanding correctly. It's part of employability. If you're going to have to make a decision, let's say two companies offer you a job and one is going to be offering you a four day week and understands work life balance and is a, a, a very good company when it comes to climate change. And the other company is offering you more money, but it's five days a week and they are still very old school when it comes to climate change and you have to make a decision. Now, you want to go with your heart, but what's your head telling you about the money that's being offered on, on both sides? What, what is going on? How do you compute one against the other? And you need a level of financial literacy in order to do that. And that's really important because the employer is wanting to employ someone who can do it, who's going to stay with it, who's resilient, who's flexible, and in three years' time or two years' time is still there hasn't ducked out and said, oh, I shouldn't have taken this job. It doesn't give me enough money. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And we have many questions from the audience. Is it okay if I ask you some? Um, um, if only I can answer them, that will be good too. We have one very interesting question, which I believe everyone has at a certain moment asked themselves. As a new graduate, and with so many paths available at work, how do I define my path? Mm, this is a really interesting question. 
Yeah. Are you looking for a career for life or a lifetime of jobs? Are you looking to seize a straight line of development? Or are you going to see one of these, one of these, perhaps one over there, and that it builds up how you're going to earn your money, look after whoever you need to look after and forge your way through in life. And I think accelerated by the pandemic, but certainly not caused by the con pandemic, is the sense that an old fashioned career working its way through up. So you, you start making tea and you earn and uh, end up in the C-suite. These, these days, are gone, it, it is very, very rare. So part of your resilience and flexibility is starting off and maybe moving to one side and maybe to move to another side again. A path think of as a rocky, un, uh, with no tarmac adam on it, a road which is bumpy and then suddenly there's a, the bricks, the boulders have fallen down, you can't get past, you have to reverse, you move sideways. A path, mm, not so much. Yes, that's absolutely, I believe. Um, well, from the time my parents uh, were working, uh, that, that was sort of different, right? We all saw movies and we've heard and we have parents and grandparents who had uh, one job for the rest of their lives, right? They started a career at a company and they continue their whole life. That economy, that reality, is gone, has changed. Nowadays, we have so many new jobs, so many new opportunities. We ourselves have many interests and we start, many of us start um, working really young, right? When we are 20, 22, uh, so many things, interests that we don't even know yet that we have, right? And we have heard this many times, but it is a reality, the jobs that uh, will exist in 10 years, we don't even know now. So uh, as we said, we have to be all the time learning, uh, testing, proving. And what do you think the, um, the value of, or let me rephrase, is it necessary, is it important to have a purpose with our job? You know, some people talk about um, wanting their jobs to, mean, to be meaningful. Uh, what do you think about that? How where does the meaning, purpose, values equation go into this uh, career development? There's meaning within jobs. And then there's the purpose of the job in the broader context. So sometimes it's difficult to find meaning in your job. And an, an old colleague of mine, used to say, you've got to learn to be bored. And sometimes that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. You're not going to get this elusive job satisfaction all day, every day. But if your job is more than just fitting in a moving part, a cog in a wheel in, or, in order to do that, then you can see a bigger picture. But I think that anyone who wakes up every day and says, I'm glad to be going to work. They're very, very lucky. And I'm not one of them. Well, I am. So <laughs> I, I am very happy. I'm very happy uh, doing my work, hosting these webinars, having coaching calls. So I, I, I'm really, um, yeah, I'm really happy. Um, and But this has come with a whole process, right? I've had jobs that I didn't like at all. I've had um, difficult bosses, just to say the least. I've, I've experienced many hardships. And like you said, I went from one job, another job, I explored different industries and it is a self um, um, discovery process, right? And someone is asking this very interesting question. So what skills should I have to be able to develop myself? Hmm. I... I know what you shouldn't have. It, 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 it's hard to sort of enumerate one of these, two of these, 60% of that. You know, it, it, it's hard, but there's a lot of people that I've uh, worked with to help put aside their timidity. They're, they're maybe risk averse. They are maybe down on themselves. 
they maybe catastrophize a situation and say, oh, this is so terrible, I can't possibly do it. Oh, look at these things that, that have happened and so on. And it's been harder in COVID and during these times. But if you can find a way of, if you're not down, pick yourself up and, and start right over again, then that's the kind of resilience that you're looking for. And again, it, you're going to hopefully be in front of employers. And, and, and what's really important is to avoid, avoid believing everything that they're going to tell you about the company that's great and they'll have a wonderful time. You have to learn to identify what we talk of in the Americas and here is bullshit. You have to realize that people are going to do a snow job, are going to talk nonsense at you, are going to talk bullshit. And there's a great book uh, by Harry G. Frankfurt, which I'll hold up here to, to the camera, who's a Princeton professor, was a Princeton professor, who has written an excellent little book on bullshit. And I would recommend it to everybody who wants to try and understand the skills that they need looking for a job, learn to spot it at 50 paces and you'll be doing very well. Yes, that's a very important skill to have also critical thinking, right? Just to reflect on what we're told and what we are experiencing and, and not always buy things at face value, but be able to reflect, uh, analyze, and then come to our own conclusions. That is uh, super important too. And let me see one. I have a very interesting question too. Uh, while still being a student, can one become overqualified with too many internships and extracurricular activities? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. You, when, you, when your employer, you're looking for uh, people who like being students, who in, your, in, in an employer's terms, don't take uh, on the responsibility for completion or seeing things through. They'd rather do another degree rather than seeing things through and following things through. And so you can have too many of these things, but be careful about the extramural activities because they're not the same thing. If you are working in a difficult job and you have experience from, let's say, playing sport or playing in a band, of, of something similar that's happened and how you've resolved it, these skills, these intuitions, these approaches to uh, how to resolve a work situation may well come from your extramural activities. And I know an employer who, when he looks at a CV, turns it upside down and goes to the very back page to see what the person has been doing in their spare time. And if they've led an uninteresting life in their spare time, he won't employ them. So watch okay. out for doing too many degrees, in my experience, but extramural activities, oh yeah, especially sport and creative activities. Um, someone is asking if you can repeat, please, the name of the book. I'm going to, <laughs> to share it then, but yeah. It's on bullshit, and it's by Harry Frankfurt. Nice. Okay, so we are uh, getting to the end of our um, webinar. Uh, if someone has a very interesting question that wants me to ask. Um, Jonathan, is there anything else you would like to share? I'm going to end with, a, with an old Scottish expression. Um, you've got a, a time now where you're going to have to build yourself up and get yourself ready for a lifetime of jobs. Maybe not a clear career path, a lifetime of jobs. I'm going to say, Langmayer Lumreek, which 
means long may your chimney smoke. Get that fire stoked up, get it going, and charge around getting as many jobs and as interesting a life as you possibly can. That's a beautiful message. So I hope everyone uh, has his, her fire and they we, we can make it bigger and have this um, very interesting creative right energy of fire and all the strength that it has. We um, all have very interesting possibilities. There are many options. One thing we need to, um, like we said, be open to learn, understand how we learn, what works for ourselves, be flexible, right, adaptable, and definitely um, share uh, our interests, knowledge with our coworkers, uh, sharing, having good relationships, communication is essential. And definitely uh, for our interest today, take this opportunity, this internship opportunity to do this exercise, right? To reflect on how we learn, um, what challenges we have. You know that in terms of uh, your program, you have two coaching calls for you. The coaching call is the moment where you can reflect with the coach about your struggles, what else you can do, what you're learning. So take advantage of these two coaching calls you already have in your program and then keep yourselves uh, nurturing uh, and with this fire so you do the most with this internship. Thank you, Jonathan. It has been a pleasure for me to talk to you. And mine too. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm quite happy to talk with uh, anyone who's uh, in the audience at any future time. Yes, and so I'm leaving here uh, Jonathan's contact. You can find him on LinkedIn and uh, you can uh, continue asking him any question you may have. So thank you everyone for having uh, been here today. I really enjoyed uh, your comments and talking to you. So see you next time. And thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, for everything and all you have shared with us today. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.